praise the Lord. Well, welcome to 412 Church. It's always good to hang out with you guys. If you're new with us, we're going through 2 Peter, talking about growing in some grace. I want to start off the, uh, the night to ask, does anyone have any cash? Does anybody have a $100 bill by any chance? Do you? Do you? You have one? You really? Can you give it to Dave and Dave can bring it up? It's not for your, it's not for you to keep. I need to borrow it for, you don't really have it? Oh, you don't have it? Okay. Does anybody have like a hundred dollar bill on them? Okay, great. Great. Everybody's lifting up a hundred dollar bills. This was the right time to talk about some money. Woo! I thought you guys were going to go like this. Everybody's like, hey, it's right here. This is nice. I'm married with four kids, so I have not seen one of these in a long time. Long time. Hey, Benjamin Franklin's on the $100 bill. Well, from time to time, you hear of a counterfeit ring going on. You hear about some people on their computers at home in their basements just printing out cash. And sometimes it works. They'll take this $100 bill, although this is real. Good job. They'll take a $100 bill that's counterfeit. They'll, they'll, try, to, they'll try to duplicate almost everything. They'll try to make the, the counterfeit $100 bill look just like the, the real one. Now, to be completely honest with you, I wouldn't be able to tell if this is counterfeit or not. Besides, it has a, uh, a little strip here and a, and a, and a watermark. And, and what we want to do is we don't want to spend so much time staring out at, at a counterfeit. What we want to do is we want to spend a lot of time knowing the original. Amen. So it doesn't do us any good to, to constantly look at what's counterfeit. Well, let's see its inconsistencies. No, I want to know what the real hundred dollar looks like. So I can say, Hey honey, guess what I had today? A hundred dollar bill. I know this is real. So I want to look and say, there's a watermark. Okay. So Benjamin Franklin's on the hundred dollar bill. So if, and when a counterfeit came my way, I would be able to say, wait a minute. I know what a real hundred dollar bill looks like. What you've given me is, is not real. It, it's not, here you go. It's not, uh, I wasn't going to give it back, but since everyone's watching me, you know, <laughs> she would have sat through the whole entire message. You think you're going to give me my hundred dollar bill back? <laughs> going to go out to eat with that. So what we want to do, so what we want to do, no, I'm not buying any donuts or cookie dough or brownies. Shame on you. So what I want to do is I want to know the truth so much that whenever someone brings something that's false, I'm able to spot it. How are you ladies doing tonight? A couple of you, okay. Some, sometimes a young, good-looking man will come your way, right? Has he knocked on your door once or twice? No young men have knocked on your, not like your physical door. Bring it down. <laughs> Ooh, I see how the night's going to go. From time to time, you may get hit on. Has any ladies ever been hit on before? Like six of you. Okay, great. The others of you, this is what normally happens when a guy hits on you. Okay. He will say, he will say, you know what? I have never seen such a beautiful woman in my entire life. You must have just stepped out of heaven because I hear angels singing right now. And you would say, I know he's right. And then you get all butterfly, you start to, to flutter. I told my wife this. I said, you know what this is? That's opportunity knocking, baby. You better answer that door. And I married her. Yes. So the flattery words that guys tend to use are like the gateway. Tell them, hey, tell you you're beautiful. If your man's not treating you right, I'll treat you right. You know what that, you start to think. Hmm. Hmm. Is this real or is it fake? Now, you don't know until 
a couple of dates down the line, right? He's acting good for a while. He said all the right things. But you know, something just wasn't right. Anybody ever get a flag when a guy is hitting on you? You six that raise your hand? Once in a while, uh, a flag, you said, this, this is a little too good to be true. But you still went out with them anyway. You still dated them anyway. And then sometime down the line, another flag, another flag, another flag. And you said, God, why did you do this to me? He's like, that's all you. He said you were beautiful and he had you. That was it. The little words that kind of snuck in there. In our text tonight, in the next couple of Wednesdays actually, word got back to Peter that some false teachers came into the church. Now remember, the church wasn't like this where we gather together in some big building. It was like 412 East, North, South, and West. So all of you guys were a house church. So that section, you had a house church, you were a house church, you're a house church, and you're a house church. Well, so uh, um, uh, bishops and deacons were, were put in the church, but they were at visit one church. So youth section would be waiting for a teacher to come. Well, all of a sudden, these guys would come. Hey, praise the Lord. God bless you. Saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Woo! You're like, hey, we have a house church. Come and hang out with us. Well, I don't know. I'm kind of busy. No, come. You got your Bible with you. You look really holy. I mean, come on in. Well, the false teachers, they got into the house church, wreaking all kinds of havoc. So word got back to Peter in Rome. So he was writing, hey, watch out for these things. So turning your Bibles to 2 Peter, understanding that backdrop, these false Teachers are now infiltrating the church. And remember, the church didn't have the full canon as we have. They had some letters. They had what Peter told them previously. So Peter laid the foundation for them. They had some other um, um, apostles' letters. So they had a nice foundation. But then these false prophets come in with these nice words and things didn't go so well. So Peter is going to write to the church, the house churches, to warn them of these false prophets. So 2 Peter, we're in chapter 2. And 2 Peter is in the New Testament towards the end of your Bible. If you start at Revelation and hang a left, you will find it pretty quick. 2 Peter chapter 2. When you get there, give me an amen. amen. All right, good job this section. How are you guys doing? Amen. All right, good, good. All right, 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's read verses 1 through 3. It says this. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bringing on them swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. We can spend a lot of time on false teachers, and I spend a lot of time looking at on YouTube and reading a bunch of stuff, and craziness is going on. If you like to watch religious TV, you definitely need to be careful. You should watch religious TV like this. What do you say? Mm -mm. But you know what happens? We see people getting jackets thrown on them. We see all of these people. We see all of this grandeur and we're like, wow, wow. If you're at home right now, the Lord is telling me you're sitting on your couch. Oh, I'm sitting on my couch. You've had a tough day. I have had a tough day. God is speaking to you right now. Why well, do you want God to speak to me? So that 
drawing in. This guy or lady is charismatic. They got me. We're like this. This is why we need to be so careful. What do we need to do if you're taking notes? The title of the message, by the way, is, hmm, that sounds right. Number one, know your Bible. What does your Bible say? It doesn't matter how charismatic someone is, if people are having their jackets thrown on them, if people are falling out. All of that doesn't matter. What does the scripture say? Now, I'm all for Holy Spirit. This place is yours. You do whatever you want. If we're praying and, and someone happens to be overcome by the Spirit of God, personally, I'm okay with it. I'm not okay with me throwing my jacket on you. You know, I'm not okay with people running around. I'm not okay with somebody prophesying while I'm talking because that's not scriptural. So whenever something happens, albeit TV or the place you call church, what does this say? Amen? What does this say? No matter how entertaining someone may be, what does the word of God say? Peter says false prophets, they're among the people, even as there were false teachers among you. Listen to what uh, Peter says. He says, for I know this, that after my departure, what? Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves. Men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Let's go back real quick. And uh, among you, after my departure, savage wolves will come in, in among you, not sparing the flock. It's also from among yourselves. So again, you're a house church, you're a house church, you're a house church, and you're a house church. Somebody in your church, after Peter's gone, is going to say, hey, you know, when uh, Peter was saying that, I, I'm not sure if I believe that. You know, there's a new, better way. So now that he's gone, you're going to rise up and you're going to try to take over your house church. So Peter is writing, letting him know that there are, they are among you. Now, all of you look really holy and spiritual. Most of you guys have your Bibles. You're at church on Wednesday. You're like, whoo! But what do you believe? If you were in charge of your section... What would you teach your section? That's the question. What would your section be known for? Would it be known for trusting in the gospel? Or would it be known in maybe some prosperity gospel? What would your section be known for? What do we do? What do we do when we come across something like this? The rapture. May 21st, 2011. This is a billboard, by the way. The end of the world is on October 21st. You know, the, the, although we're talking, some people believe this. Not only did they do this once, but there's enough. Save the date. The return of Christ on May 21st, 2011. This is your section. Someone from your section is rising up saying, hey, you know what? I think Christ is going to return uh, in May. And instead of somebody in your section saying, hey, that's not what Peter or Paul taught us. That's not what the gospels taught us. That's not what Jesus taught us. Jesus says no man knows the hour, so you got to go. Instead of doing that, the person in that section was teaching false doctrine. So what is our defense against false teachers? It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for what? Doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why we're always encouraging you guys. Go find out for yourself. No matter how funny I can be sometimes. Does that really matter? What does this say? Maybe I'm funny because I want to lead you astray. Maybe laughter is the gateway to your heart. Maybe I'm going to ask for an offering at the end of the night. I already got one sister. No, she's got a hundred dollars. Oh, he's got a hundred dollars. I know he's got a hundred dollars. So just maybe that was God saying, you know what, Henry, you need three hundred dollars. My shoes could use a, a little a little waxing. I'm a I'm a tie guy. I love suits and ties. You know what? 
Why don't we ask the flock for $300 and somebody brings some brownies next Wednesday? <laughs> and although we love each other, you probably would give me $300, which is normally cool. But you see, see how that works out? That, that you get to know someone and things kind of open up. So just because we know each other, that does not mean you don't check my doctrine. Amen? And that doesn't mean you say, well, you know, he's a funny guy. We're, we've known him for years. Yeah, give him some money. What does the scripture say? Why would I ask you for money? Why would I do that? My car works most of the time. You know? I am hungry. But why am I asking you for money? Why am I coming to you? Why would I come to you and say, hey, I need you to give me money? Because the, the Lord says, really? This is how it begins. Charismatic, funny, laughter, you're getting ministered to. Hey, by the way, I've got a small need. I have this student loan, which I do. I would like you to pay off the rest of my student loan, and God is going to bless your socks off. Now, some of you would say, yeah, psh, but maybe if I kept on going, how awesome would it be for you to, to bless the pastor by paying off his student loan? Some of you probably have the resources to pay off my student loan. No amens for that. No, it's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> you may have the resources to say, here you go, in the memo, student loan, praise the Lord. So I could say, the Bible says, God loves a cheerful giver. It says that, right? It says that, just in case you know. It says if you give, it will be given to you what? Press down, shaking together, running over. Pay off my student loan so God can bless you. That it'll be pressed down, shaken together, running over. Listen to a few of these guys. This guy says, Sow your $1,000 triple favor seed and receive God's unstoppable favor. I blocked up the number so none of you would call. <laughs> so he's saying, give me $1,000 for triple, triple favor, not just a single or a double. He's triple favor that somehow you're going to send this guy a $1,000 and you are going to be... Is the word triply? You'll be blessed three times over. He's not the only one. Sow your seed of $1,000 with expectation of a harvest. Can't see the phone number. What is he saying? Give me $1,000 and watch what God will do. So you're telling me that in order for me to have the favor of God, I need to send $1,000 to you. And I just need to be expectant. Okay. A little faith. Faith involved. Okay, I can kind of understand that. This guy says, this is my free gift to you. This is a point of contact. What does he have there? Acts chapter 19. Sounds spiritual, right? I blotted out his name so you didn't email him either. Um, it says, this guy's name, he wants to place in your hands the green prosperity prayer cloth. Okay. Which this guy has personally blessed and anointed. That's phenomenal. He's blessing that stuff. Thousands of people around the world have used this biblical point of contact. How is it biblical? Don't know. Point of contact prayer cloth to receive abundant blessings of financial prosperity. To receive your prosperity handkerchief and instructions on how to use it. Order yours today. He's got a scripture. His face looked pretty holy too. He's like. He threw a scripture there. We don't have time to read it, but people were, were, being, were being healed by this pretty unique way. So this guy says, you know what? Hey, it happened once. Why don't I go ahead and make a business out of it? I can throw a scripture up there. You know what? Let's do this. We have time. Let me read it to you. 
Acts chapter 19 says this. Starting at verse 10. And this is Paul at Ephesus. Let's go back to verse 9. It says, but when uh, some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, the multitude, he departed, Paul, and he withdrew himself to his disciples, reasoning uh, daily in the school of Tyrannius. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Greeks. Verses, listen, verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. So that's pretty unusual, right? So this guy says, hey, you know what? Okay, Paul did it. Let me buy a million handkerchiefs and sell them for a hundred bucks and tell him, hey, this is just like what Paul, what, what Paul did. We can't make a doctrine out of one scripture. It was pretty awesome, but it was just a unique miracle. People see this in the Bible and they say, you know what? I can throw a scripture on this and I can have people send me money. People send this guy thousands of dollars because they are believing that having this miracle prosperity handkerchief, I'll place it upon my bills. Here's my handkerchief. I believe and I trust the man of God told me. Why is it not doing anything? Oh, let me read the instructions on using the handkerchief. God, help us. Help us. And forgive us on our journey because we're going to be a little redundant from time to time. But this is real. This is not just made up. That people are on TV asking for money and money and more money. False teachers are among you. Hmm. Peter says that this, it would be a destructive doctrine. Family, how are we saved? Are we saved by works or by faith? By faith through who? Through Jesus Christ. Is it um, a free gift? Does it, does it cost us anything? It's a free gift. So I wonder why sometimes people on TV, sometimes people on the radio, that in order to be saved, you have to do all of these things. A few years ago, we had um, Adam's Road out. Anybody was here that night? Adam's Road. They're, they're former uh, Mormons. And he talked over and over again about how it's, it was a works-based system. He's now out of that, out of Mormonism. But he's talking about how he had to work for things. He had to work for his salvation. What about the cross? What about the cross of, of, of Christ? Is, is, was that not enough? Anybody former, former Catholics? Here tonight? A lot of you. All right. All right. You probably heard of purgatory. Anybody, Anybody attend any of those prayer meetings for purgatory? A couple of you. What were you doing there? You were praying for the person who died for their punishment to end quickly, right? So they can go to heaven, right? That's what you did. Well, is, you, you prayed him out of hell. It, that's not here. That's nowhere here. Not even here. You know why? Because Jesus took our punishment on the cross. So the cross seemed pretty painful reading about it. He suffered, paid the penalty for my sins 100%. Why am I going to then die and then suffer more? So if I am then suffering more for my sins than what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough. Isn't that rather blasphemous? What you did on the cross was not enough to save me. So now I want to pray for my dead loved ones to, to get out of purgatory. That's, that's nowhere in here. Nowhere in here at all. What does that do? Sometimes religion puts this, you need to come through this doorway first. Come to us and we'll teach you all about what happens. No, you go read for yourself. To be absent from the body is what? Good job to be present with the Lord. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when you die, we're not going anywhere but to see Jesus. Amen. And it's not because we're awesome, because we know we're not awesome. 
we have glimpses of sometimes of awesomeness, but sometimes we're just not so great. But we're going to heaven because of the cross, because of putting our faith and trust in Jesus. Not because we're great people. We're not going to go suffer for our sins because Jesus Christ did that. But again, you're a church, you're a church, you're a church, you're a church. You know, when you die, I don't believe Jesus, what he did was enough. In fact, I don't even believe Jesus was God. Jesus was, was a man. This was called agnosticism. Started sprinkling its way throughout the church where they were leaving biblical teaching. And I wonder if Jesus did pay for my sins. And again, the teaching of purgatory is still around to this day. If we would but read family. Can you imagine the freedom of those of you that are that used to be Catholics? How free are you knowing that when you die, you're going to, going to go see God? How free are you knowing that when you pray, you can just pray straight to God? How wonderful is it knowing that you don't have to come through a priest or a pastor in order to have your sins forgiven? If I was a priest and someone came to me, what are you coming to me for? What can I do for you that you can't do for yourself? You go pray to God yourself. Maybe I'll be out of a job. But praise the Lord. We, know we need to be in, in, in the habit of pointing people in the right direction. Amen? God, help us. Philippians chapter 4 says this. Not that I speak in regard to need. Paul says, for I have learned in whatever state that I am in to be content. I know how to be abased. That means to have nothing. I also know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is this teaching called the prosperity gospel that God wants you to, uh, to be rich. It'd be awesome if that were true. But it's not scriptural. If it's scriptural, then how does Paul say, hey, I've, uh, I've had a few times when I didn't have very much of anything. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. But it sounds good when someone tells you, hey, God wants you to, to be rich. We're like, really? That sounds awesome. How do we go about doing this? Do I need to go to church more, more than a couple nights or what? I would like to sign me up for the get rich program. God wants you to be happy. You're not going to find that in here. God is not necessarily uh, concerned about your happiness as he is your obedience. God wants me to be happy. Jesus, are you happy? Jesus, I know you've got you to go to the cross. Hey, are you happy? I want to make sure you're happy. Paul, I know you're about to, you know, get uh, 39 stripes. You're about to get stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked. Hey, Paul, are you happy? I want to make sure that your walk with me, that you're happy. Nothing to do with happiness. The prosperity gospel didn't work in the first century because someone would have stoned the person that said it. It works today because... We're charismatic. We dress real nice. Maybe have a few nice things. Hey, if you want to have what I have, this is what you do. Send me $1,000 and start that. Can you imagine if all of you sent me $1,000? Give me a calculator. I would be so happy. I mean, that's a lot of money. Think about that. If all of you sent me $1,000, my student loan debt would be gone. Over and over and over again. Then I would say, if you want to be like me, this is what you do. This is how you live. This is how you believe. I have this great faith. What people do is they'll send someone money. Someone will have the audacity to say, help me, Jesus. I need a new jet. Really? You need a jet? To go preach the gospel. I could be wrong. My faith could be poquito. (laughs) 
I just don't know how I would say, hey, thank you, Jesus, for my jet that I may go and preach the gospel. Maybe I'll start some kind of internet ministry or something that's a little lower than a jet. But yet people would still send money to support that because a man behind a pulpit carrying a Bible says, this is what God, this is how God will bless you. Family, there's, there's, no, there's no certain spiritual pill you can swallow that'll say, hey, you're now spiritual, that, that, that you're now a, a, a super Christian, that you're now um, strong. You have to take your Bible and read it nightly and pray. You need to come to church. You need to worship. You need to have fellowship. That's how you grow. There are no spiritual shortcuts. It would be nice to have no bills if you're willing. But if he's not, that's okay. But it's wrong for a minister, in my opinion, and according to Scripture, to what's called fleece the flock. As much as I would love my student loan to be gone, it's wrong to fleece the flock because... As we're going to learn, not tonight, because we're almost out of time, but next week, we're going to learn that God is going to visit that. God is going to visit that with the vengeance. And now I'm not uh, raining on anyone's parade. People, they don't even know who Henry Lundy is, so they do their thing. But I want you guys to know, know your Bible. Know your Bible. You don't have to send money to anybody. You don't have to have any prayer cloths rubbed upon you or laid upon your bills you just need to have faith in jesus christ jesus christ doesn't need a thousand dollars you don't need to put anything on you jesus here i am here's your word here are some brothers and sisters let's lay hands on one another and let's pray see that seems too simple we, we say something like that and well that's easy well, why does faith have to be hard those of you that maybe have a Pentecostal background, you know that when, when someone is ill, people gather around, anoint you with some oil, right? And they start saying the name of Jesus really, really loud. Anybody? Anybody? A yeah, couple of you? A couple of you? So shouting the name of Jesus is going to do something other than just whispering the name of Jesus. We over-spiritualize things. That Why can't faith be, Jesus? Your word says, just as small as a mustard seed, if I just simply believe like this. Here's my mustard seed. Jesus, I believe that you can do whatever my need is. In Jesus' name, amen. And walk away and let God do what he's going to do. But instead of that, we want some big spiritual-looking thing as if God is not honored with our mustard seed. The story of Naaman was a perfect example. Naaman came to Elisha the prophet Heal me of my leprosy. I want this big thing. Before the guy got to the door, Elisha said to his servant, hey, go tell Naaman just to go away. Go wash. Go wash in the, in the river Jordan seven times. Naaman went away mad in the same way he came because he wanted some big elaborate thing. What if our faith family is just simply acknowledging we're a sinner, believing in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins and he rose again the third day? What if our faith is that simple? It is, but we sometimes complicate it. And Peter is talking to the people. Be careful. It says they're even denying the Lord who bought them and bringing on themselves swift destruction. People from your section. You know what? I don't think Jesus really, really bought me. You know, I, I don't think that he really, really ransomed us. I, I don't believe that Jesus actually saves us. I, I don't believe he did that. J. Vernon McGee says it like this, or one commentator says it like this. It says, here we should pause to remind ourselves that while these false teachers to whom Peter refers had been bought by the Lord, they had never been redeemed. They've been bought but not redeemed. The New Testament distinguishes between purchase and redemption. All are purchased, but not all are redeemed. Redemption applies only to those who receive jesus christ as lord and savior availing themselves to the value of his shed blood it's like this if you go buy a liter of of, of coke a cola you go out and buy it right if you if you redeem it you're gonna get what a nickel right you've purchased it 
but it's not yet been redeemed. You've all, according to scripture, have been purchased. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you just haven't been redeemed. So the transaction has happened, but you are just not redeemed if you don't know Jesus. In your area, people were saying, you know what? I'm not sure if we're really, uh, Jesus really did what he said he was doing. And Peter says they're bringing on himself swift destruction. First John chapter 2 Verse 19 says this, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they might have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were with us. Family, there are people that will stand next to you, but they're not on your side. Does that make sense? Ever been betrayed once or twice? They were standing next to you. They weren't on your side. Time happened. Revelation. Peter saying, oh, they, they went out from our section. They went out from our group. They were with us. Praise the Lord. God is good. You know what God's been doing? He's been just blessing me. Look what he's did. That's all. It was all fake. It wasn't real. They were in the church, but they were not of them. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We were purchased with a price. And our response to that is that we should glorify God. As these false teachers are in and around their home fellowships, they're wreaking havoc. Verse 2, it says, And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. If you're taking notes, we have A, the message will sound really good. It'll sound almost scriptural with like a, a, little, a little twist. It's kind of like, well, if you're dating somebody and one of your followers of Jesus' friends say, hey, is he saved? Well, you know, he's really good looking. He's got a good personality. He's got a great job. My mama likes him. Yeah, but, but is he saved? Well, what do you mean when you, when you, when you say saved? You know, he, he says he's, he's spiritual. No amens for that for some of you ladies, huh? Looks like a light shining on you right now. You're like, move along, pastor man. You're going to go home. The pastor was talking about us again tonight. Yeah. We need to do something about this whole dating thing. You know, you need to get saved, all right? Being spiritual is not enough. So when you go home, if you go home to that certain individual, yeah, being spiritual is, is, is not enough. It sounds good, though. You know, I believe in, you know, I believe in God. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's going to sound really good. It says, and many will follow their destructive ways. Tell me what, tell me something that makes me feel good. It's kind of like sometimes church can become like a therapy session. I want to leave here feeling good. Well, if the, if the scripture text doesn't uh, call for that, you're not going to leave here feeling good. Sometimes the scripture text says, hey, you sinner, repent. Ooh, I, 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 I'm not sure if I'm going to come back on Wednesday night. Yeah, I, I don't like that whole sinner, repent thing. I'm, I'm looking more for like a feel good, tell me how great I am, how much God loves me and the, the plans he has for me to prosper me and bring me this great end. Yeah, I don't want to hear that I'm a sinner. No, I don't want to hear that. So sometimes people church shop because it says many will follow their destructive ways. Let me tell you what you can do to have a, a happy life, to have a bunch of money, to have the blessings of the Lord. You're like, okay. I'm waiting. I want to be happy. I want to have a lot of money. I will follow your five-step program for $1,000. I will give you this five-step program. It says the way of truth will be blasphemed. This word blasphemy means to speak irreverently about God or sacred things, to be defiantly irreverent. Charles Swindoll says this, that this is a redefining the standard of righteousness. 
Their motivation is to tamper with the truth in order to free oneself to indulge in their carnal appetites without restraint. So what they're saying is, well, we know kind of how the Bible sort of kind of maybe says this. These false teachers says, well, let me tell you uh, an easier, an easier way. Henry, you can have all the cookie dough you want. It's okay. God doesn't care. Go shopping, fill up. You deserve it. Anybody ever hear that lie? How's that working out for you? You deserved it, so you went and got it. They are redefining what, what the Bible says. With just a little bit of truth, things can change. It's like abusing the grace of God, using it as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Let me give you a couple of scriptures, and then we'll leave. Galatians 5, it says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. So we're free. Amen. Good job. We're free to do whatever we want. Love God, love each other, go have a great life. We're totally free. We can do whatever we want to do. Well, we can use that freedom to say, well, I have, I've got first John one nine in my pocket. Whenever something goes wrong, I'm like, Even when we plan to do stuff wrong. First John 1 9. This guy right here, keep it close to you. We are free, but the Bible says don't use your freedoms for the occasion of the flesh. Because we love us some of our flesh. Amen. Oh, only a couple of you like flesh. Mm hmm. Uh huh. We love to, to take care of this right here. I've got some needs going on. God, you're taking way too long. I've, I've got some, some urges. I need to take care of this thing. We're free, but don't use your freedom for an opportunity for the flesh. Romans 6, 1, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans six fifteen. what then shall we sin because we're not under law? but under grace. So these false teachers are pretty much saying, hey, go do your thing. It's all good. It's all right. You deserve to be happy. You deserve some pleasure. You deserve all of these things. And in the meantime, we are wrecking ourselves. Wrecking ourselves. And oftentimes, we don't see the, the, uh, uh, the destruction that we're doing to ourselves until later on down the road. Because whatever seeds we plant, they're eventually going to what? They're going to come up. It's going to take a little while. But if we sow to the flesh, what does the Bible say? We're going to reap to the, to the flesh. If we sow the Spirit, what? We put the Spirit. So let's start planting some, some good, some good seed. But it all begins with knowing what God's Word says. If you don't know what God's Word says, begin to study God's Word. Because I guarantee you, your life will be faced with a couple of issues. And if you don't know what God's word says is we're going to default to what we always do. Self. I want to make myself happy. She may not be saved, but she sure is good looking. We can work on that God. Please work on that God because she's fine. No one, she doesn't know anything about Jesus, but she's fine. Woohoo! You have you a fine non-believer. That's awesome. You're going to church, she's staying at home. You're tithing, she's wondering why you're spending her money. No amens for that, huh? We have a few uh, sessions sometimes and marry an unbeliever. All that to say, let's know what the Bible says. Because this is like part one of a few. Let's know what God's word says. And knowing what God's word says, it's going to set us free. It's going to set us free from the false doctrine that says, if I want God to bless me, I've got to send somebody some money. It sets us free knowing that when we die, we don't have to pay for our sins in, in, in purgatory. It sets us free knowing that what Jesus did on the cross is enough for you. It's enough for me. That there is nothing else that God has to do. 
Think about that. If God didn't bless us with another day, the cross is enough. Amen. There is nothing else besides the cross. If the cross is not enough for you, family, nothing else is going to be enough for you. You can make money, get a car, get a home, get a wife, a husband, have some kids. You're still going to be in search of something. Jesus Christ satisfies. These false teachers were, were saying, Jesus doesn't satisfy. Come follow me and I'll show you the, the right way. Follow Jesus. Amen.